everybody, and thanks for joining us. It's nice to see you. I'm Duncan Hood from the American Schooner Association and the Great Chesapeake Bay Schooner Race. And we are joined today by two very highly respected um, luminaries, if you will, in the sailing world. So we've got Nancy Richardson. Say hi, Nancy. And hi. Captain, and Captain Daniel Moreland. There he is. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Tonight, we have a chance to view what I think is probably one of the most influential movies uh, that I really have practically ever seen. Um, I saw this movie when I was traveling with my wife on a circuit around Fundy Bay. And we went up to Prince Edward Island and came back down, got to Chester, Nova Scotia, and it was raining. It was raining and the local arts center was going to show this movie. And my host at the BNB said, we're going to the movie. We went and it was absolutely delightful. So I fell in love with the movie. I fell in love with Chester. And here I am back in Annapolis. So we're going to talk a little bit about Irving and Exe Johnson. And we're going to talk a little bit about not only their boat, but also about the Peking. It's a very large uh, schooner that will, no, I'm sorry, very large ship that we'll see in just a little while. And to get started with everybody, let me give you some ground rules. Currently, we've got our comments, I think, I hope, turned on, and our Q&A. So since you're joining us now, let's test that out. If you guys would just type in where you're dropping in from. Um, I'll start off and I'll just simply type Annapolis, Maryland. And let's hope everything works out. Oh, there's somebody from San Francisco and West Vancouver and Alexandria and Maine. Now, uh, Daniel, both you and Nancy should be able to see that if you hit your- Oh, Anna's on. Isn't that fun? Anna Johnson's on. Yeah, isn't that fun? Yeah. So it's great. There we go. My goodness. Well, we have had the largest registration turnout that we've ever had. There were 285 people registered. And uh, thank you all for coming along. It means a lot to us as we put these things together and do it. Now, uh, Captain Moreland and uh, Nancy, we're going to talk just a little bit about the Johnsons. And uh, Irving and Exe made a huge impact on our sailing world. And I wonder if we could start out, Nancy, if you could talk about, because you actually knew them, it's a lovely story, how you met them and came to know both of them. Take it away, Nancy. Hey, it started when I was first a Girl Scout as a Brownie Girl Scout. And my mother bought a ticket to hear Irving talk about their fourth world voyage. This was in about 1948, I think. And um, I thought, okay, mom, take me to the thing. And, but I was totally transfixed by the photographs that he showed and the places that they had sailed to and the people that they were with, et cetera. So um, I wanted to be a Mariner Girl Scout right then. I had to wait until high school and, and our troop had sailed with Yankee, that was the Irving and Exes, the name that they put on all their ships. Um, anyway, as a mariner in 1958, we sailed on Yankee. That is my troop from New Jersey. But it was right after Irving and Exe sold Brigantine Yankee and transition to their catch that they sailed Europe and other interesting places. Absolutely. Um, but I, I followed Irving and Exe and their, their sailing opportunities and 
got to know them through Mariner Girl Scouts and others. Um, and, and Irving sometimes came to New York to go to the New York Yacht Club or to uh, the Explorers Club. And I worked at Girl Scout National Headquarters. And so he'd been, bring me along. Um, That's a great story. <laughs> and I, and I, we were walking up Fifth Avenue one day and I was a bosun's mate in the Coast Guard Reserve and I was having a hard time getting the heaving line over the after rail in the search and rescue. Um, so he put his arms around me on the curb at, on Fifth Avenue and showed me how to lean down and then let go when I was pointing at my target. So I, I can claim that Irving had his arms around me when he, when we, uh, when we, um, when he taught me how to throw a heave line. He had a it. wonderful sense of humor. Well, and he they, was a very powerful. They went around the world and they, they started really a lot of these charter type things that now we kind of take for granted. And uh, Captain Borland, can you talk a little bit about the legacy they may have left for us? Well, I think um, it's it's impossible to overestimate their legacy because I and I and I think there's, a, there's you could spend hours on this, try to encapsulate it. <clears throat> but there's uh, organizations, ships, institutions, particularly in the Western Hemisphere, that don't even know that they're subject to that legacy. Um, no. But I would describe um, while he trained in the in the uh, sunset days of the Age of Sail, which was a very powerful experience, you could easily also describe him as the is one of the first of the Young Turks. He broke free, he and Axi were a partnership and they did an amazing thing. And I think what's amazing is that what they did, they didn't go to focus groups, they didn't ask, you know, they did what they wanted to do and their audience came to them, whether they sailed with them or whether they came to lectures or saw movies or established SEA or, you know, or yeah. any other number of, you know, a hundred other things. And so the, the Western <clears throat> lexicon for sail training and sea experience is deeply founded in the Yankee. Now, even if they don't know it, it's deeply mm. founded in the Yankee. So the legacy, it's sort of like the Beatles legacy. You know, people say, oh, I wasn't influenced by the Beatles. Oh, you wouldn't even be a group without the Beatles. You know, you don't have any idea, you know, so, yeah. and likewise. So it sort of go. It, it's beyond consciousness. So um, what they did and what is so intriguing is we, we hang it on things, oh, seven around the world voyages, great seamen, this and that. No, passion for life. They were dedicated to their life. And that is extremely attractive. And we all want that. Everyone wants to have that passion and that certainty in what you do. And that is compellingly attractive. But yeah. and that's what they did for their entire lives, uh, individually and collectively and together and apart. And, and that is a very powerful thing. It included, you know, components of being a master pretty much in all his crafts. Yes, he was a great seaman. Yeah, you have to be to do that crap. Come on, you can't just, you know, <laughs> dot you. That's not a play. But he was messaging, um, getting an audience, getting the platforms you needed to get your message out. Um, and, you know, these are not small things. You can't just simply be a great seaman. You have to also, you know, the voyage is not a small thing. You're a year and a half. That's you're, you know, Pete, you're going to find out your weaknesses then. That's not a two-week yeah, thing where you can that. tell the same these, yeah. these stories that you told last week. This is a very huge thing. And <clears throat> and I would expand on those um, kind of themes. Uh, right. to go on at length. But uh, I think that they, we, uh, which first, uh, that we, we need to remind the next generation of how significant they were. Um, but, you know, us growing up, that, you know, there was a passion for them. Everyone knew them. Everyone heard of them. People who didn't sail heard about the Johnsons and their world voyages. And they attached um, enigmatic value to it and beyond their ability to explain it, yeah, which is fine. Yeah. That's beautiful. I think so, so. I mean, you can go on at great length, but uh, he, he and they together, you know, pursued those things that would allow them to accomplish this. They weren't, it wasn't dumb luck. Yeah. You know, Irving That's particularly true. set out to become a, an accomplished mariner. And Exy is no slouch. She's often, oh, she was the one that held, no, no, she was a crackerjack mariner too. She was very often the only watch officer that wasn't seasick or poisoned by fish, and she held it together. And but uh, you know, she did milk and clean. No, no, no. Actually, was a she had a lot of iron in her soul, and she was a crackerjack mariner. Excellent point. But they were a team, and Nancy, don't think they I were. see you. I see you nodding, Nancy. Absolutely. 
also oh, okay. part of their legacy. And I'm sorry, I don't know how to do this any other way. This is my card for the Top Sale Youth Program. The twin brigantines are named Irving Johnson and Exie Johnson. And, and uh, I got to ask Exie if we could name the ships here at the Always LA Maritime right. Institute after them. And we sail with thousands of kids from LA who often say they've never seen the ocean. So wow. that legacy is carried on in their name on the ships that are uh, very similar to the, to, to the uh, Brigantine Yankee in the 50s, or 40s oh. and 50s. Yeah, how wonderful. And that's now, all true, but um, I would submit that there is not a, a sail experience, sail training uh, operation in, the, in North America that doesn't have a direct link to uh, the Johnson's voyages. Uh, and I mean a direct link, so. Yeah, that's a big deal. Now yeah. we're about to queue up this movie and it's about uh, Irving Johnson's first trip around Cape Horn in the Peking. And the Peking was a very large sailing ship. And I believe, um, Captain Moreland, you were talking about that he went as a passenger and that's what allowed him to film this. Can you explain well, that? that uh, I mean, that was very, he could have signed on as an ordinary seaman, he would have gotten the job, but that mm -hmm. meant he wouldn't have been able to make the film. Yeah. It also meant he wouldn't be able to understudy in the way that he's, he desired. He knew exactly what he wanted. He wanted the experience, but he wanted to study it in a certain way. He didn't want to peel potatoes and trip rust. He wanted to learn what was going on. He had an agenda. This is the best way to serve it. And he wasn't proud. I mean, he was very proud. I'm going to say he's very proud. But he knew that this was the best way to do it. Pay your ticket, get to do what you want. And then he blended in with the seaman. He went aloft, he made sales. But he could also step back and make the film and study it. If he was an ordinary seaman, he would not have been able to do that. He would have been on watches and he'd be chipping rust. And, yeah. you know. yeah. and this is the thing he, to do. Is, he, go ahead. Yeah. And he had a friend with him so that um, the footage of, of Irving hanging on to the, the edge of the sail and stuff like that is, is shot by his friend. Very cool. But this very is very, uh, very considered. This is, a, this, is, this is, I mean, to me, you're also seeing the beginning of that sort of uh, operational genius because yeah. he could have signed on as an ordinary seaman. He would have gotten the gig, not a yeah. problem. But it means you would have to go over there and come back and subject to the discipline of the ship. He well, got to do what he wanted uh, to do. He get to achieve, get out of it what he wanted. Sure. That was at smart. The, at, can you describe the Peking? Uh, Four-masted bark. She was sort of the classic uh, around the 1880s. She was the big steel ship, 2,400 tons. Um, you know, the largest, the, the Sea Dove, the Kruzenstern are, are like her today. They're, they're similar. Um, big steel cargo carriers, and, and they represented the last uh, generation of age of sail cargo ships. They didn't need many crew. They sailed pretty well. They're driven, but they were the epitome of the, um, I call it the sunset of the age of sail. They were great ships, very well thought out, very evolved. And if there's ever to be another generation of great ships, they will start there and move forward. But yeah, 2,400 well. gross tons, I mean, thinking like Irving and actually Johnson, those are 100 ton vessels. Rome, Picking Castle is about 300 ton. So uh, this is a large vessel and none too many crew. None too many, I mean, 25 crew or something. Yeah. And think of the Cuddy Sark at 800 gross tons would have had 40 or 60 crew. So it's a, it's a, it, these are very well thought out um, commercial. They were there to make money, commercial yeah. uh, pieces of marine technology. Sounds great. Well, I'll tell you what, I think we've uh, beaten the bush enough. Why don't we take a look at the film? And as we go, um, for you viewers, think of some questions you'd like to ask them. Uh, captain Dan Moreland is, uh, of course, captain of the Picton Castle, a large, large um, sailing training ship. And Nancy Richardson has done everything you can think of. And she's now very active with the Los Angeles Maritime Institute. So. She's got quite a wealth of knowledge to bring in as well. And uh, looks I like can claim to have sailed with Dan Moreland on, on uh, I guess it was Ernestina. Probably, yeah. Oh, good fun. Good and fun. And maybe you, but you haven't sailed with me on Picking Castle yet. I'm, I'm very, I'm Oh, hurt. yeah. And, oh, you have. Okay, good. So two ships. It's shots. coming. Good. It's coming. And, and um, the schooner from South Street. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, Lady yeah. Howard. 
All right, my friends. Yeah. Here Lance we and I go. Roll shipmates. Let's hope it all works out okay. Everybody ready? God help us all. Go. Can you hear okay? Here we go. Sure, hope everyone works. I grew up on the farm in Hadley, Massachusetts, and here in the attics we found these old bicycles. This is a bone shaker uh, before they discovered the chain and the sprocket and so forth. And it kind of trained on this sort of thing here. We found a lot of super high wheelers too with enormous uh, wheels. This is made for a racing bicycle for a tall man. I can't reach the pedals all the way down. But I'm getting trained for Cape Horn, and this is the one way to do it. Uh, when you put on the brake, it's a disaster. But with a strong neck, I'm still alive and ready to climb up something uh, that I could find on the farm nearest Cape Horn uh, Mass. Uh, this pole is rotten at the bottom, but it won't fall down on account of the wires. Uh, I'm swaying now, making believe I'm off the horn and getting ready for that sort of thing. But uh, this is a kid with a one-track mind, if I ever saw one, just uh, standing on his head to make sure he'd never be scared, as he's been reading about in the books by Jack London and so forth. I thought the books uh, by London were, were factual, but they're, they're fiction. And they had a fight on every other page, so I trained and trained. He became a wrestler, jiu-jitsu expert, uh, acrobatic expert, and therefore never had a fight on all the voyaging I've had the, uh, years later. I got ready for it on the farm before I'd even seen salt water. But now we're off for adventures, great sailing adventures aboard the Peking, and this enormous four-masted bark carrying 5,300 tons of cargo. She has 32 sails over an acre of canvas, and she's an, Im an immense, uh, sailing, the largest sailing ship in the world at the time by about five tons. Uh, those three lower sails each weigh a ton uh, or more when they're dry. When they're wet or full of ice, no one knows what they weigh. But she's carrying uh, 5,300 tons of cargo plus about 3,000 tons of ship. That's 8,000 tons sailed entirely by human hands. There's no motors, there's no winches, there's no switches, there's no lights. Nothing but human hands to power this entire vessel, to drive it 11,000 miles where it doesn't want to go the wrong way around Cape Horn. I've gone aboard now in Hamburg in the winter times, cold uh, dust and soft cold smoke and smog all over the place. And the North Sea in the winter time is a horrible place. We stayed there week after week until this greatest storm of the century came up on Friday the 13th of December. 1929. This storm wrecked 68 ships along the coast of Belgium, H Holland, and Germany. And we are out there in this storm, but of course this vessel was built for Cape Horn, so this storm, as long as she didn't run aground in the comparatively small North Sea, was safe enough, but what we almost did pile up on the coast of Holland. Here, a picture from the bowsprit of the figurehead and the three-ton anchor hanging over the side uh, it was caught by the waves and dashed back on deck, breaking the chains that held it, and then we went up there to secure this anchor on deck. We got bashed up too, carried some of the fellows aft to be patched up by the captain, who was an expert at repairing a seaman, no matter how they seemed to be smashed around. And imagine the tonnage of the water smashing, bashing to catch a th three-ton solid steel anchor and throw it back on deck. There's a young fellow up here fa making fast the inner jib, and he's got a job to do, and he go ahead and do it no matter what. There's something about these vessels that uh, cause some kind of hypnotism. You do things you'd never dream of doing in your ordinary mind. But look now, this is just the North Sea. This is not Cape Horn. The rails are going under maybe three, four uh, feet or so, but off the horn they'll go uh, 20, 25, 30 feet underwater. 
And they, remember how cameras cut down the size of waves? If you've ever taken pictures of waves, you'll find them looking terribly small when you come out with the pictures. But those waves are still just North Sea. They're not Cape Horn. Off the Horn, I got uh, 80 feet high, and they'd come up between me and the horizon. But here's the sailor who's been bashed around the deck for a while, and he's kind of catching his breath now, wondering what he's going to do next. He's hanging on to the lifelines. But he's a good sailor. Standing on one of the spare spires there, he's emptying the water out of his boots into his oilskins and making himself a little lighter. Not drier. There's no way to dry anything except by sleeping in your clothes uh, on, on board. Now, these pictures taken from the lowest yard on the mainmast uh, here, the six yards on each mast, and uh, when you get up to the top, it is some height. But again, the North Sea seas are nothing to what it will get off the horn when I get down that way. But 17 days were spent in the North Sea until finally we got a fair wind and headed down in December, down south to the English Channel, putting on chafing gear to prevent the sails from chafing, especially during the doldrums when you're just rolling around with no wind. But chafing is a deadly enemy on board ships, and we're always watching the sails, checking, checking everything to see they don't chafe undo. But here the skipper is heaving the lead. You drop the ed lead from the end of the bowsprit, it's 56 pounds of lead, and it's armed with grease to make sure to bring up a sample of the bottom. And uh, here they're learning the lines, 350 different lines. We had to learn the German names of, and they don't even know them in English. And boy, you better learn them, because if you don't, you either smash something or kill somebody, and they take a dim view of either one. But the captain's right there just ticking them off and just saying how dire it is if you make the wrong step. But here, we're plowing south, gradually repairing things. We did have damage during that enormous storm uh, which sunk so many ships in the North Sea, which is a graveyard, the greatest graveyard of the world in ships in years gone by. Now we're cutting off the old stay and going to seize on a new one. We carry miles of wire and all kinds of repair equipment aboard the ship. They were supposed to not supposed to go into any harbor for any reason whatsoever except the harbor of destination for the cargo. These vessels are self-sufficient for months on end with food, water, supplies, repair equipment. And down on the bowsprit, they're smearing the wire, bare steel with white lead and tallow before parceling and serving, uh, therefore preserving the steel for years to come. Here they're bringing the three-ton anchor back on deck where it is securely bolted for the voyage around the horn and they don't get it out unless they happen to get too close to land. Here's the skipper heaving up on a corner of the three-ton anchor, and he can move it too. He's 240 pounds of muscle, and what a man. On his 56th voyage around Cape Horn, more than any man I ever heard of, but he is a super seaman, and I said there's nothing I could do better than follow his lead and how he survived that many times around the horn. Here they're having lifeboat drill, which they had once during the voyage, <coughs> and uh, it seemed to be uh, sufficient because generally you can't get lifeboats over anyway unless it's fairly smooth. In rough seas, uh, forget it. And uh, they're, 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 they're very handy in, in moderate conditions, but not in very heavy seas. Uh, skipper, lending a hand here and now, nobody takes a chance with his discipline, no matter what. The rope, rope's in, in the mate's hand now. Somebody made a mistake in one of the lines, so they're all getting the training, and what he does is name some line uh, there, and they rush off to grab a hold of the line he's named, and then he names another one, and they rush off to get a hold of that. Of course, after a while, he's kind of tired, so then he names something way up the rigging, and by the time they get down again, uh, he can rush after them, He's, he's rested and he can rush after them again. And there the first shall be last, a fellow capsized in the slippery deck. Now he has this special dog now, owned by the skipper, who knows just where to bite these fellows to make them go faster. He's supposed to bite the last fellow in line, but sometimes he makes a mistake and he got the first fellow in the line that time. Here he comes uh, there, and you must run up and down the rigging. There's no walking, handling sail is always on the double. On a Sunday, I train, help train the fellows and wrestling and so forth, which they wanted to know uh, very badly because it was so obviously uh, easy to handle somebody if you know wrestling. Uh, pictures taken now from the end of the foreyard. It seems I'm almost off on another vessel. Uh, they, uh, uh, looking back there, they're repairing sails on deck. We make all our own sails as we go along. Everything is done aboard ship that possibly can be. 
and uh, so they can repair the ship. And generally, she looks better coming into port than she did when she left, especially on deck. Over the side, of course, the rust streaks are impossible to get at while you're on the way. Now the forecastle head is nice and dry, and the bowling wave here bowls ahead of her here, just a marvelous place to be and watch that wave. And then way out ahead of us, the end of the Bosphorus is generally speaking 50 feet above the sea, but sometimes it dives under the sea off the horn, and that we expect to see later on. Captain arrives with his dog, uh, specially trained by the skipper like no other dog I've ever seen in my life. And he, every other day, he simply grabs the dog's muzzle and just squeezes till the dog shrieks with pain, and then he says, now look, that's for nothing. Now see you don't do something. Now that's the general way. The dog has never been petted, knows nothing about it, will take a piece out of you if you try to pet him, as he has no knowledge of it whatsoever. Never did. Here the fellows are splicing up new ratlins, which are getting old in one of the masts, but all of a sudden, the wind changes, so they dash off to change the attitude of 32 sails to the new wind direction. Also, 18 yards must be altered to the same conditions, and this day or night, no matter what, you get used to. But it's quite a maze of rigging, 350 lines. But there you have sailors as close to heaven as sailors ever get, way, way up aloft, like anyway. And that all does help. But what a spot. All those sails, and you put them up there and made them from scratch. Skipper with his Sunday coat on, taking a sight, and that gold braid would turn green if there's any spray. Here he's uh, cutting hair. He's an expert. Also, these fellows uh, very seldom pull on something. They, they jerk. They can make a lot more strength stra strain on something if you jerk, like pounding a nail. Through a, through a plank. Uh, you, if you tried to push on the, on the nail with a hammer, it'd never go, would it? But if you hit it like a big jerk, you can create five, ten times more power momentarily, a split second. And that's the way they sail these enormous ships. Now here on a Sunday is the port watch lining up, but they're all going back, except the man at the wheel and man on lookout, going back to catch up on sleep. They're on four hours, off four hours, on four, off four, and they eat in their time below, and they mend their clothes in their time below. There the skipper, an expert on everything aboard ship. Look at the size of his hands cutting this fellow's hair. The trouble is to get some scissors to get on his fingers. We have to use special ones. Here are a lot of fishermen and fishermen's advisors out of the bowsprit, and uh, trying to spear. Oh, look, the, the shark wouldn't touch that salt pickled pork. It's simply no lean on it at all. It, it greased our potatoes, though. I'm in the center now, sewing sails. The sailmaker's at my right with the officer's cap on. And this is double odd hemp canvas. And now you could make a pile of it seven feet higher on deck and stand right up there by itself. It's so stiff. I could do 20 feet of seam at racing speed uh, in an hour and do about two feet the next hour getting <laughs> over it. But the dog doesn't want any petting. Just kick a stick and kick him in the face, and that's all right. That suits him fine. Now we're changing all the sails to the older suit of sails, the weaker suit for wear and tear through the doldrums and through the trade ends and all. But when we get down to the horn, <coughs> our back will go with the stronger sails, the strongest possible we can do. Now when you pull with your hands, up go your feet. Now this seems a very silly sort of a way to be up on there. Why doesn't somebody tie these foot ropes down where they belong? But no, that would be too easy. And it's, it seems to work. We all trust the foot ropes, even though they go high on your head. Oh, look, one day the turkey gets sick, so we ate him quick before he died. Well, you know what I mean. We, we, we dispatched the turkey before he died of some sickness. And anyway, it tasted good. It didn't poison us at all. But here we have four propellers chewing along, chewing up the weight, going like a bat. Four propellers? No, it's simply the wind in the sails, the sails that we made with our <coughs> own hands, and we put up there with our own hands, and we adjusted with our own hands. Roaring along she is now, 12, 14, 15, 16 knots, tremendous, 8,000 tons bowling along. This is what we love. We just created it. We see, we feel like supermen. We made all this happen. And she is going, 8,000 tons going where we want to go, not necessarily where she wants to go. Coming about the first time, I thought they, somebody had made a terrible mistake. I thought the yards would crash down, but no, they didn't make any mistake. The skipper doesn't make mistakes. He's a super seaman if I ever saw one. And I believe the things I learned from him saved my life several times over in our many voyages around the world. 
Uh, oh, look, the dog bit the wrong fellow. You're not supposed to bite the paid sailors. We have five professional sail sailors aboard, and but he's supposed to bite the, the, the trainees, you see. We had a lot of trainees aboard, and they needed a little biting now and then to make them go a little faster. And they get the idea, and here's a way of multiplying power, but through our hands only, every hand is on the capstan bars and pushing fast. A handling sail is always on the double, so that they'll always know how to do it and won't get caught, uh, caught in any other way. See the notice, the jerking now? Ha, he, ha, he. And the he is when you all must jerk together or it doesn't work. Lovely dog. I wanted to pet the dog, but there wasn't a chance. He'd never been trained that way, and he thought you were doing something bad if you tried. Beautiful dog, but no sense at all from our point of view. Uh, Charlie at the left there, a special pal of mine, he's tearing down the rigging. And of course, when you do that, you become kind of a mess. Now, he is positive uh, that I wouldn't waste any film on this kind of a, a business, but he was a little mistaken, and he had trouble when he showed this picture to a Sunday school later on. Now, these sails are becoming bleached and just beautifully white, bleached and cleaned by the rain, and there's no pollution out here whatsoever. But you should see the, the safety regulations they have on the ship. You know, they never heard the word. Safety, what's that? Take care of yourself in every case, and you'll be all right. And that's what they teach. Now, looking down, look at these sails on one mast. Down, 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 down. We got sails down, down. And finally, you can barely see the ship way down there. Sails, they are what make it go, what we make, and our connection with the... Uh, elements are through those sails, and I have a few extra pictures of them, but I'm not ashamed of it. The sails are everything. They are our connection. But the fellow on top is simply stacking the other fellow yeah. down in a line. Neither one of them is fastened, you see. And uh, so why should you be? Just pay attention and get a hold of something. And it'd be silly to let go, wouldn't it? And as I said, there's no safety regulations whatsoever. Uh, one time I was lecturing in a place where they had a bell, and the bell went off at exactly the right time for this fellow who just rang it there next to the wheel. Uh, sunsets and sunrises look the same at, uh, at sea, and not very exciting uh, without uh, color film. But this was before the days of color film entirely, over 50 years ago. The fellows are using leather boots now. I, I had rubber boots, but they're much more clammy than leather boots. And I hadn't even heard about it when I went on the ship. Uh, eight bells and the folks led, and this is in a work day, one of the weekdays, so the mates come down from the midships get to give each man a job. Uh, one, one or two men go to the wheel, generally one man. And uh, man on lookout, uh, five or six go to the sailmaker, eight or ten go to the uh, blacksmith. Now, there's a lot of blacksmith work, there's a lot of metal on here, it gets worn, gets broken by the seas or storms. And so there's a lot of work. A hundred feet long, this brand new four-cylinder building here. We built the pieces down below and we put it together on deck where there's a hundred feet of clear space. But otherwise, there's nothing like that below with the cargo in there. We had general cargo, manufactured goods going to Chile. But they're sorting spuds there, and now they're bringing hundreds of pounds of seaweed from the open sea on board the ship, looking for parasites. They found over 50 kinds of parasites, put them in formaldehyde, and the captain is hoping that someday you'll find a new kind of fish or parasite that will be named for him. If you ever hear of a just fish, Captain Just, J-U-R-S, uh, you know that he's found something on one of these voyages. They were signaling a ship, a steamship, returning from near Cape Horn, the Strait of Magellan, uh, they had a shipwreck, and they're bringing back the survivors. Uh, the Strait of Magellan is some 250 miles north of Cape Horn, uh, and is a strait not nearly big enough for these big sailing ships. Here's a 13-foot jellyfish, the biggest I've ever seen. I suppose you might be killed if you dived into it. I don't know. I didn't know how to try. But the doldrums are something that are quite easy to describe. There they are, like a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Of course, that's a famous uh, quotation. And that's where we're sitting right now. We're sitting there. Oh, it rained la last night, so they caught fresh water on the deck for washing clothes. You're not allowed to use it out of the tanks. There's not enough to get washing clothes that way, so you catch it yourself. But you're sitting here day after day. Luckily, instead of being there two and a half weeks, we did it in two and a half days. 
because we'd lost 17 days in the North Sea and we're lucky to get through here in, in a hurry. It's a very quiet sort of a place. We're barely moving, but we are moving some instead of sitting solid now. And there's that super seaman, the captain, on the bowsprit, uh, about to spear a fish. And he, and you know the, how the light rays bend when you look down in water? And you have to throw the spear where the fish doesn't look like it's there at all, but he's been doing it for years. I just couldn't seem to catch a fish this way, and he did it nearly every time. But he has been at it for ages. We'll, we'll have that to eat about 20 minutes from now, fairly fresh, I'm sure, and it'll taste good. But now they've just thrown the chip log over the stern. There's a gadget on the end of the line which doesn't slip through the water, and it unwinds the line from the reel. And when the first knot of the line runs out, the mate will holler, turn. The boy with the hourglass turns, and in 14 seconds, when that sand runs through, he'll holler, stop. The mate stops the line, and uh, having counted the number of knots that ran over the stern during that 14 seconds, that'll be the speed of the ship in knots or nautical miles per hour. I'm at the wheel now, there's another boy standing by. The worst thing you can do when you're at the wheel is get her back, get the sails, uh, the wind on the wrong side of the sails. It takes the whole gang about half, three quarters of an hour to get her straightened out. It's really a mess, and all, everything is all going the wrong way. But now, again, we're tearing along. This is what we dream about, repairing cargo gear up there. In the center of the picture now is a light tower uh, in which is an elevator. So when the stormy seas come over the forecastle head, you got to put the side lights on this elevator down below, put it up inside the light tower, and the light shines out through some very heavy glass in the sides and forward. Now those are the side lights, the red to port, green to starboard, found a ship. Now I'm going down the stay from the top of the fore topmast to the end of the bowsprit, some 17 stories down. And of course, you're not supposed to use your uh, legs for gripping the stay. If you do, you'll wear out a pair of brand new pair of dungarees in one trip down. Simply hand over hand up, hand over hand down, and no sliding. That's only done in Hollywood when they get something special on their hands. No sliding. That is absolutely not only frowned upon, you just can't do it with any skin left. Now, I read about a fellow again. I didn't know whether it was a, a truthful book or, or just a novel of some sort. And I, a fella came down the edge of sail, so I get, gave it a try. Another fella got pictures of me. And uh, I found I could do it, even though I had to hold the fingers straight and thumb straight and pinch the canvas between the ends of my fingers and thumb, a most insecure feeling, but it did work. And when he showed these pictures, the captain back in Hamburg, he said, ah, that was not done. I don't know how I figured he got the pictures, but it wouldn't have been done if he'd seen it, that's for sure. <laughs> But I tried these things I found in books, and many things worked. We're getting down towards the horn now. Things are getting a little rough. If he f f drops that food, he won't get any more, so he has to watch it very carefully. We also are putting up nettings above the bulwarks to strain the sailors out, like fish nets and so forth. The bulwarks are maybe five, <laughs> five, six feet high, but the seas go right over them. You see the netting there at the right now? That saved many a seaman being washing around the deck with his waves go through the net, strains the sail sailors out. Here they're filling the fresh water tank for in preparation for Cape Horn, because some of those days you can't get buckets of water. You'd think they'd put a pipe from the pump right into the tank, but no, that would be too simple, I guess. Here, off the horn now, we're here in a fog and practically no wind. Now this happens much more often than you think, no wind, but uh, fog, just occasionally, and they always send the dumbest fellow on the watch up here to crank the foghorn. It's not so loud enough to be heard at the stern of the ship, sort of a wee 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 wee, <laughs> sort of a thing, but uh, you've got to keep it going according to law. I'm disgusted with the weather. I came all these thousands of miles to get a big storm off Cape Horn, and here they're repairing cargo gear on the deck with no wind at all. It is just sitting here, and the uh, sails hardly fill. Uh, we're, we're being here, drifted please. back by Not the here. current. They're going the wrong way. We're, we're trying to go the wrong way around the horn. Of course, east to west is noted as the wrong remember. way. And I'm disgusted. But I took a precaution of going to Ireland. Look at this. Not a, not a ripple on the water. Not a ripple. I went to Ireland before going on this trip to the Giant's Causeway, where they got a wishing seat and a wishing spring. I drank from the spring. I sat on the seat. I wish for some A number one first class storms off Cape Horn. And look what I get. <laughs> for a week or ten days, nothing more than a couple of mile an hour breeze, flat calm here, 
and uh, even though I'd made all these wishes in Northern Ireland. But finally it came. It had to eventually and came up with a big blast, sent us scurrying to the sails. There's 40 men furling one sail, the foresail here, and they're not up there playing tiddlywinks. There's 20 men out on the starboard side with body and soul lashings on, and 20 more men out on the port side, body and soul lashings on because the buttons are not strong enough to hold your oilskins against the storm. Winds getting up over 100 miles an hour later on. But you put lashings around your waist, around your ankles, around your wrists, and around your neck to hold the oilskins on. Not to keep dry, but to keep it a little bit warmer in the blast of freezing cold air. Snow every month of the year. We got snowball fights around the deck. The two fellows just coming into the picture at the right here now were washed overboard uh, on the way home. Uh, that means two empty bunks. And nothing is said about it. It is all very quiet. Now, you must be on the ball at all times and get yourself out of the way of a big wave coming roaring across because there's not time for somebody to tell you how to go about it. You wind yourself up on some wire or, or the a lifeline that's specially put up there for the purpose from the windward side, because otherwise you get bashed away from whatever you're trying to hang on to. Pictures from the top of the mast now, 17 stories high. And when I showed these pictures in London, I lectured to the Honorable Company of Master Mariners, where every single man in the audience was a scurrier skipper or retired. And they said afterwards, not a man in the audience, and we represent three to 4,000 times around Cape Horn, has ever seen that much water across the deck of a vessel that has not sunk. Can we get a copy for the British Museum? So I got a copy in the British Museum. I thought, what can a young fella do to get something in the British Museum? It's incredible, but there's no other pictures taken under these circumstances ever taken and never will. There's no more loaded square riggers. This is storm number two. In between the storms, you set sail. And you're going to see the, the, the ocean down here in the third storm looking like the bottom of Niagara Falls. The whole wa water just blowing horizontally now. Just, uh, just, uh, you can't sit down. It's blowing so fast. You're up over 90 now, and uh, the next storm will, will bring it over 100 miles an hour, just screaming, 350 lines, screaming like you never, like, like you're torturing animals to death. The noise is fantastic. Setting that force, you saw 40 men furling. A bundle has been caught there. But in between the storms, the water, wind goes down often to an absolute flat calm. It makes it a very difficult place to sail around, but it's not all storms. Now, nobody writes about smooth water. Well, wh what is there to say about it? No wind, period. Now watch this. The bottom of Niagara Falls looks exactly like you're going to see it here in about three, three or four seconds because a tremendous open part of the sea is shown just tortured. Look, tortured, 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 just like the water coming over Niagara Falls. Look at this, the open ocean. The forces involved are fantastic. There's no words that I can use in any language that'll tell you what it's like. If you've been there, that's the only way you'll know because the forces are beyond anything you've ever experienced or thought was possible. Our lower topsails are built to stand any storm, and yet we had trouble there too. But the screaming is beyond belief. You'd all get up and get out if you had that noise of that caliber around here. And oh, she is really pumping and straining. The noise of the vessel when you're down inside, groaning one piece against the other, you'd think it was coming apart. But it's built for Cape Horn and was not about to come apart. But oh, how the chafing and wear and tear, not only on the ship, but on the individuals. The lookout on the deck is back here amidships now. And I, I'm holding the camera steady with the ship. This is not the way to take it, but I tried it out to see what it looked like. The, it looks like the ocean is running around. The ship is staying still. Every bar taut line is just quivering and screaming. And the lookout is back here. And I'm, I'm on top of the chart house. And now, now the camera's held steady with the horizon, which is the proper place, way to take pictures. But to get pictures from down here, when a rogue sea may wipe you off, is just asking for trouble. And boy, trouble came in a big way. All of a sudden, I was afloat with a smashing crash. Couldn't even shut off the, the camera as I was knocked galley west uh, here. And uh, oh, look at her roll. But that rogue wave just had my name on it, and I came within one quarter inch of getting smashed. There she goes, smashed up completely and over the side there as I washed off the top of the chart house. 
But uh, that's the kind of thing I'm dying to get pictures to show my mother, father, brothers and sisters what it's like off the horn. And this is the nearest to it we've ever seen. Look at that one. Just, well, that's what I see happens when it comes a little bit aft. And then you get two seconds of pictures and you're finished. You're underwater again. The camera had been underwater a hundred times. It was not made for that. Oh, here's one of the greatest sights. A main lower topsail carrying away. Now, in the edge of the canvas is a wire the size of your thumb. And the steady pressure of the wind just broke that wire. How, I don't know. But that sail is not supposed to be taken in ever because so they've got a preventer sheet out there on the end of the yard that's got to be unshackled before you can pull up uh, what's left of the star of the sail. And then they must all go up there and furl the pieces. You save everything, even little five or six inch strips uh, of pieces of, of marlin. You, you don't waste anything on these ships. And if the fellow who goes out there to take the shackle off the preventer sheet gets touched once by that canvas, he's dead. Boy, he just knocks him off and that's that. The skipper on deck was blowing his whistle trying to make him uh, stop, but we couldn't even uh, uh, hear him five feet away. But when they got that corner of the sail pulled up, the clue of the sail pulled up, you'll see a four-inch strip of canvas down the lower right-hand corner just hang down there. You just barely see it now. But the third mate got up on the end of the yard could not reach that four-inch strip of canvas, so he hung down. And I missed the best picture of the whole trip. I ran out of film. He hung down by one arm and one leg from the foot rope, and just then a squall came and the ship rolled to windward. And that man's entire body vibrated just like those sails, just the whole, whole body just flapped, just like the sail. Never have we ever heard of or seen such a thing as a man's body flapping like a sail. But when the man came down, Nobody said one word to him. We all would have done it. Some kind of hypnotism makes us do those things. This is just incredible. You, you, they, they, when you look at them later, it's, it's, it's crazy, but they do it under the conditions of working for the ship, making you go, she needs you. And when there's something like that going on, you would do the same thing too when you're young under those conditions. Look at the water just blowing horizontally, just the whole air is full of water. When you breathe, you breathe water along with some uh, air as well. But I tell you, it's just wild, the circumstances. The nets are getting tired now. They're gradually wearing and chafing down, but they saved many a life. And how the seas do crash across the deck, wear and tear at the equipment and the rigging and all that, and we have to watch the chafe, and finally we have to drive the ship 200 miles west before it can turn north. Uh, Cape Horn is just, not just a point where you go around and finish. No, so you've got to go 200 miles west against the currents, against the winds, and then head north. Uh, otherwise, Chile has got the worst lee shore in the world and is known for smashing up ships by the hundreds there over many years. But these fellows are at the after wheels now. Their midships wheel broke. And they're, they're lashed here now, so they won't get thrown over the side by the wheel when it gives a <coughs> kick. If it chooses to kick, it can catch in your clothes and throw you right over the side. But now we've turned north. We're headed up towards along the coast of Chile. And uh, the, the mates came to me and said, look, did the captain ever tell you how he saved a couple of fellows during a storm? No, no, tell, tell me about it. Oh, he said he doesn't want anybody to know about it because he, he deserted his ship. But what happened was this. He saw somebody washed overboard forward, and he ran to the stern, grabbed the spanker sheet in one hand, and jumped over the stern into the boiling cauldron uh, uh, under the stern during a storm, grabbed the man's hair as he came by, and we pulled him back on board, one hand on the line and one hand of the man's hair, and he did that twice. Now, the reason he doesn't want anybody to know about it, and in fact it's never been in print, is because a captain should not desert his ship. And here he goes jumping over the stern, but he's a superman. 93 days out, we see Chile now, the first sight of land. And here's a little tug with a big stack, loud whistle and no power, but uh, uh, useless to us. So I was able to get on the tug and to get these pictures. Looking at the bow of the Peking, coming in now. Oh, all my still pictures were double exposures. Luckily, you can't do that with a movie camera. And there you have the ship. Sailing in proudly, oh, the vessel that we fought for, that we went into danger, that we got bashed up on, that uh, caused such agony, cold, wet, sleep in your wet clothes, no other way to dry them. But that's the vessel we fought. The, why do you do it? For cargo. Cargo is king. The only thing that's dry on that ship is the cargo. And if you don't bring in dry cargo, you might as well stay at home. 
the cargo is cared for absolutely, the seamen must take care of themselves. But what a voyage! What I learned there that saved my lifetimes and the future, watching every detail, making sure it's right ahead of time. And that captain really is a magnificent example of a seagoing character. And they developed the most efficient carrying of cargo under square rig of anybody in the world, the Flying P Line. All the ships named are the P for the first letter. And they are in the, what's called the nitrate trade from Chile to Hamburg, backwards and forwards, and the skipper done it 56 times. Now for the last time, they're putting in a harbor furl here, and I was disgusted. There's no tug in the port that could pull us up the harbor. The captain had to beat the ship up just as if it was a private yacht, beat the ship up the harbor, all 8,000 tons of her after 11,000 miles of struggle, but he was used to it. That's the only way he's come in in all the years he sailed, beat the ship up the harbor, on his own power. Up aloft there, fellas. You only got 17 stories to go. Hurry up on the double. That's right. And what a what a uh, voyage this was. Here's the uh, upper to Gansel yard coming down. Half the yards, you know, come down and have to be pulled back up again. Great big steel yards all by hand when you set sail again. Nine of them come down. Here's the foresail being pulled up. This is the one you saw 40 men beating the ice out of it there off the horn when they finally got some wind. What a magnificent thing to come out with one of the best storms going. The captain agrees that was a, a number one first class storm, the like of which is seldom seen even off the horn, that number three that we saw there. And I was there with a camera to get pictures of it. How lucky can you be? And now as we come in, upper tops of the yard coming down, it's 92 <coughs> feet long, bearing about five tons, and somebody will be pulling it back up again eventually. But lending a hand now, the skipper, what a hand, I tell you, 22 turns. You know, normal yacht has three turns. Uh, this is, has 22 because it's enormous size and weight. Down goes the anchor, the last bit of film, except for one shot of furling sail. And in Talcoano, Chile, 93 days out. There is one shot now of putting in a harbor furl. The, the mate sat down there the first time I've ever seen him sit down at all. It was about 30 seconds, though, and he's busy again with the ship's detail. But why do they sign on for all this misery in some cases? Well, they kind of forget about that. They think of the thrills, but mainly they think of the sailing along as the sun goes down in the trade winds. Oh, it's absolutely lovely. That's Cape Horn as I saw it. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Is that fun or what? <laughs> oh, goodness gracious me. In uh, my in in the book that that um, that I have the peaking around Cape Horn, Captain Johnson wrote to Nancy Richardson, who would have loved this voyage, Irving and Exie. Um, wow! I love watching the film. Put it that way. Just just amazing. It, it's it's just amazing. You know, we, we are so used to our creature comforts now, and we're used to GPS, we're used to electricity, we're used to diesel power, and it's hard to believe it was not that long ago that things were like that. What do you got there, Nancy? This is a, a glass there. That's better. Um, Irving and Exie's grandson, Matthew, created this um, etched brigantine in glass um, several years ago, um, right after Irving and Exie, the brigantines were launched. Um, and he used to call us and say, I don't know, the, the preventer doesn't look as if it's at the right angle. Where do you secure it? and other details like that. So this is as close to um, the brigantine in glass. It's beautiful. It's it just, is. Yeah. I love it. Dan, what kind of feelings do you have after watching that film? Well, <clears throat> a lot of them. Uh, Matthew sailed with us on our first world voyage, and he was a good shipmate. Um, what do I feel? Um, it's, a <clears throat> it's a good representation of it. It's uh, 
Uh, Captain Johnson's a good storyteller. He keeps the pace going. You, you know, there's some reading between the lines. Um, you know, there's a little, you know, some of it's for the, you know, set in today. But to say there weren't any safety regulations, this is true. There weren't external ones, but there were a lot of internal ones. And you did not do certain things. Um, right. Although I think <laughs> climbing down the leech of a square cell, he would have gotten pretty seriously busted for that had he been noticed. But he wasn't. Uh, very strong guy. We don't do not try this at home, children. Yeah. <laughs> that, regardless of the regulations, you know, it, you have to be very strong to do that. And he was physically very imagine. strong. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's evocative of the era. It's evocative of that transitional time. It, um, you know, we have to understand that in that latter period, there was an adventure element kicking in. We said, why do these guys do it? Well, they did it for a bunch of reasons. I mean, this is the 1921, you know, after World War I to World War II, you needed sea time to get second mate's licenses. So that was, and you had to have sail sea time. This didn't really end until the 1950s. Um, so there was that motivation. Um, it was a hell of an adventure. It was. It, yeah. it, uh, you know, now it's primarily adventure uh, experience or character development or what you might call it. But then it was like, this is a pretty cool thing to do even then. But that was also true of Richard Henry Dana's day or Jason and the Argonauts. Uh, this was a coming of age thing. This is nothing new. This is very, very old. It's also very current. So uh, Richard Henry Dana, Harvard uh, student, he did the same thing, wrote a book about it. You know, a lot of the same stuff. The ship is a little bit different, but the same overall thing. A Western bound trip around Cape Horn as a crew on a square rigger. Yeah. You know, and, you know, uh, in, in the Moreland, phrase of the day to make a man of you. Yeah, Captain Moreland, what struck me last time we had a conversation is, you know, you said to me that most people who do sail around the world do it once. They come home mm -hmm. and write their book. And we look at this captain here who's done 56 times around. Holy tamale. And you yourself have been around the world how many times? Uh, eight. Yeah. Eight times. Well, this was a skipper was 56 times as a commercial captain around Cape Horn. Um, you know, Picking Castle, we've done seven around the World Voyage. I did another one as mate in the Brigantine Romance years ago. We're yeah. hoping that we're supposed to sail pretty soon for another. But uh, we're, I'm a flying fish sailor. Uh, you can, I, I, we got this nice bypass called Panama Canal, and um, I, I, I'm, you don't see me anywhere near Cape Horn. Uh, when you see palm trees on Cape Horn, you'll see me coming close, but not. not still. <laughs> I like it. So, uh, but right. it was, it was, it was a, it's a rite of passage for a mariner. Uh, yeah. in that era. And, and you sort of earned your bones, so to speak. Um, you bet. And the, the guys and that I sailed with, also, this was a, a recognized thing. And it still is, but it's, it's sort of gotten amorphous. But back in the yeah. commercial <clears throat> shipping, it was it was a major thing. It was, uh, you know, you were a made man, so to speak. You were a made man. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we do have the Q&A uh, boxes ready. And I think uh, this is probably a pretty good time to poke in there. If you do have any questions, feel free to ask them, and uh, we will put them forward to Captain Moreland and Nancy Richardson. And let's see what we got here. These are people, all oh, guys, get over here. <laughs> all these questions are the, where you live. Oh, well, what do you do? Hey, uh, Ravita Sonny asks, why were they going around the Cape when the Panama Canal was open for more than a decade at that time? Easy to answer. Prevailing winds. Um, you know, to go through the, first of all, if you're going from Hamburg, Germany, it wouldn't be a lot shorter to go through the Panama Canal. The eastern side of the Panama Canal, very easy to sail into. Western side, very difficult to sail out of. You could be weeks. It's all doldrums for, for a thousand miles. Mm -hmm. So, um, from a sailing and passage making point of view, if you did not have an auxiliary engine going from Germany to the west coast of Chile, the only way is by uh, Cape Horn. It Very wouldn't weird. make any sense to go through Panama. Yeah. I have here, Johnson mentions a midship wheel and a stern wheel. Is this a typical configuration? How yes. does this work? Two steering wheels connected to one rudder. Well, they weren't connected at the same time. Uh, this is a common affair. Um, a lot of ships actually still have it. The Eagle still has it. And it was uh, the midships wheel was connected by chain and cable to the quadrant back aft. And the after wheel is connected to a worm screw and the cable would break from time to time. And then you'd have to run back fairly quickly and put in the, the keys, very large steel keys to connect the stern uh, wheel. But this is actually very normal. Uh, Christian Roddick, Denmark, Sondet, uh, Gorsfalk, uh, Eagle still have the system. 
Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Oh, here's an here's a nice one. Jennifer Adrian wants to know, did the dog survive? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's great, guys. I would wonder if the sailors survived World War II, but that's another oh, question. My God. Are movies still being made with tall ships? And how can one get involved if you have both production and tall ship sailing experience? That's an interesting question. Well, I can answer a little bit. We've done a number of films, a number of TV shows. Um, I'd probably check, check with Tall Ships America and or Sail Training International, depending on, you know, I'd review the ships. and, and uh, But are there major productions going on on Tall Ships? Rarely. Yeah. From time to time. Rarely. Uh, we did a Mark Burnett show. We've done a couple of films, some TV shows, but they don't, you know, you couldn't make a living off it. You, they just happen from time to time. Yeah. How many Captain yeah. Rons can you make? I mean, really? Nancy? How many which? No. That was a good show. Great <laughs> show. I love that show. Yeah. We've we've had a few scenes and and um, uh, a few bits on on the brigantines uh, with Lammy, and partly because we're so so close to Hollywood. Sure. Yeah. 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 I imagine so. I we get scouted a lot. We were scouted for mast. No, we were scouted for mast. And commander said, "This is the wrong ship." We were scouted for um, um, Pirates of the Caribbean, and after several uh, uh, lobster dinners, I told them, "This is not the ship for you." Um, <laughs> we're, and, but for the right ship, for the right movie, we're a good ship. But we, our ship kicks in maybe you know you can kind of squeeze in eighteen fifty if you're trying to be authentic. Most art departments are actually pretty good, but we're yeah. a latter day. Pickin Castle's a mini P liner. She's a small mm. P liner. That's her look, you know. So yeah, but okay. it's not for it's not we don't fit every era. And we would not have been suitable for Master and Commander or uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Absolutely. Well, that's very cool. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we can put in some more questions if you like. And uh, having said that, when you watch this film, Nancy Richardson, what feelings do you have um, watching this, having known the man himself and uh, XE as well? Well, it's not the first time I've seen it, and I I love it every time. I know that I would not have enjoyed the voyage. <laughs> Nor would I. <laughs> but um, knowing Irving and Exie and visiting them at, at their house in Hadley, um, it was always fun because Irving would tell more stories and Exie would um, tell her side of the stories. Yeah, they were. They there's an article in a uh, previous Sea History magazine, and it says uh, Exy Johnson. He couldn't have done it without her. And like like Dan has said, they were they were a perfect combination. You're full partners. Yeah. Can you yeah. tell us about Exy a little bit, Dan? Well, uh, like I said, I'd met Captain Johnson a number of times, but uh, with Pick and Castle starting in the late 1990s, we, we had a, a, a Yankee, I'd say I call it a Yankee legacy pretty much every voyage. And that would be a child, a grandchild, someone that had been, you know, who, who had sailed with the ship. And I always uh, was charmed that they weren't trying to reproduce the Yankee. They came for Pick and Castle, but they wanted that overall experience. And then uh, Mrs. Johnson and I, uh, XC, if you will, but we always call each other Mrs. Johnson and Captain Morton. It was very formal. It was quite charming. But we'd correspond <clears throat> and um, and uh, we'd write a lot of letters back and forth. And uh, and she visited the ship one time. We're having lunch. And uh, I, I was I was um, charmed by her steel, if you will. Really? You know, she was she was she a powerful person. But I, I, one thing I always I loved and she had a way of and you see, you can see it in the books. You can read it in the books. It's sort of this, this very soft answer. There's nothing soft about it. So we're having lunch on Pitt and Castle in the Salon. And I said, uh, Mrs. Johnson, um, um, because we're a sail training ship, our program is the ship in the sea. We don't do anything else. We don't do history or, you know, we're about the ship in the sea. Very mm -hmm. similar to, you know, what I think the Johnsons would have liked. And I said, Mrs. Johnson, did you ever get the question that, uh, you know, what was your program in capital P and in parentheses? And she said, well, Captain Morland, you know, Irving and I, we just thought we were too busy to have a program. <laughs> and I thought, 
you know, yeah, we, we, kind of, we kind of feel the same way, you know, yeah. yeah. Well, of course, it's, it's a baloney. They have a program. It's the ship and the sea and the islands. They cool. totally had a program. They had an in-depth, rich program that was just, it was saturated. But I always, I love that answer. And I've quoted them and it's, oh, we were just, well, we we're too busy to have a program. <laughs> right. Uh-huh. And you can sort of feel the sting as you walk away from yeah. that question. Uh, no, I know I'm very impressive. Uh, uh, but you have to remember, they were of a certain era. You know, it was sort of in the 50s when they sort of wound up the Yankees, uh, the, the brigantine. You know, it was the, it was sort of the convention that the guy was the macho guy and the woman was the homemaker. And yeah, I mean, Irving was a strong guy, but so was Exy. And they actually, Irving was softer than portrayed and Exy was stronger than portrayed back then, in my view. Yeah. That's my opinion. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there was no slouch. When everyone else was sick with fish poisoning, Exy and one and the cook were steering the ship in a gale of wind. And God bless them. Yeah, that's no it. small stuff. Right. right. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I recently had to give a speech and I, I got to say something like, um, I got to sail or over my le lifetime so far. I've gotten to sail over a hundred tall ships, but I like to say we can count ships, but the ships that count are leadership, stewardship, friendship, and teamship. The, the ships add a qualitative essence to success, to getting to a safe harbor in life. So I say to everyone, let's make ships happen. <laughs> Nancy, that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. My friends, I think it's about time to uh, wrap it up. If you can believe that, how quickly it went. And I have to say it was a real pleasure to be speaking with both of you. It was a real pleasure to have you moderate with me. Thank you so much. Everyone, these, uh, this particular session and other sessions are available on our websites. You'll see those addresses a little bit later on as we go. And so if you missed something, there's a good chance that you're gonna be able to get over there and see it. Um, having mm -hmm. said that, let's get that over. Do, do, do. Having said that, thank you very much. And we will finish off with our closing trailer. And uh, Captain Moreland, thank you so much. My pleasure, thank you. Richardson, fair winds to you. We Thank will be you. Much. I really appreciate the time you spent with me. Thanks, Thanks for asking. Oh, absolutely. We'll see you Come soon. Come sail with us. Oh, lovely. I love it. Here we go. Thanks, everybody. Have a yes, great sir. day. Take care. See you Thank later. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.